Dying Light 2 is a game that sticks to its guns. It's a game that builds on the formula established by its predecessor and in some ways brings a number of interesting additions and welcome improvements. However, it's also a game that falls back into the same traps of the original, as well as some entirely new ones as developers Techland seek to expand upon the core premise. The series is built around first-person platforming and combat, with the lead character capable of parkour-style maneuvers as they move around the world. You run around the open world, complete in a variety of missions that are designed to facilitate others in a post-apocalyptic landscape. The open world is filled to the brim with zombies, including a variety of unique archetypes which add a bit of challenge and flavour and make all of your romping around the open world all that more demanding. In order to build your repertoire of parkour and combat abilities, you earn separate agility and combat XP and unlock new skills in two distinct skill trees. However, in keeping with the name of the series, you get more XP if you run around at night, but more aggressive and powerful zombies are then roaming around in the open world, so you're incentivized to get out there after dark and mess up some zombie hordes. In Dying Light 2, the team has really iterated on the core mechanics. Running around in the game world using your parkour abilities is a lot of fun. Being able to make a beeline for a rooftop and put that together across a series of manoeuvres is really quite satisfying. Meanwhile, the combat does feel like it makes some small but meaningful improvements. I often find first-person melee combat quite mundane and lacking in nuance. While I don't think Dying Light 2 is really going to change my perspective, it feels like there's enough options for you to approach a situation in different ways, whether that's by dropping in with a smash attack, kicking your way into the fight, or using ranged weapons like crossbows. It's this moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that really is what makes Dying Light 2 so appealing. The process of running around, smashing a zombie's head in, only to bounce off over to the next, is what makes the game really gel. That said, it's also the real highlight of the game, which becomes a bit awkward when you sit back and look at it from afar. The original Dying Light from 2015 took place at the focal point of the zombie outbreak in the fictional Middle Eastern city of Haran, largely inspired by real-world locations such as Istanbul. It was quite refreshing to see a location like this being used for a game of this magnitude. That said, it leans into some particular trappings or stereotypes of the portrayal of Middle Eastern locales and cultures through the eyes of Western creators. The sequel picks up roughly 22 years after the original, where a new variant of the virus has since wreaked havoc worldwide. Players take charge of Aidan Caldwell, a pilgrim who travels to another fictional city called Villador in search of his missing sister. This leads to you interacting with a variety of different factions within the city, all with their own motivations and agendas, often leading to new quests and ultimately a storyline that will be influenced by how you decide to support them. Villador is fashioned after Central European cities, with a balance between a more historic old town and a bustling city centre area. Gone are the brown and orange hues of the previous game, as there is a stronger emphasis on greenery and foliage that has grown across this urban landscape over the past 20 plus years. The environments cater a lot more to the free-running and parkour. You can find even early on that jumps across rooftops are attainable, that drain pipes can be used to climb, construction can be swung from, and street lamps provide an ample mechanism to get from one side of a market square to the other. It's a much more interesting environment both visually and in the affordances it provides the player. You can often find good lines of traversal for you to cross an area with ease. It really plays into what is so satisfying in the moment-to-moment -moment play, as you can clearly see where you need to go and now need only focus on making that a reality. The game leans a little more on contemporary open world design by preventing the mini-map from becoming besieged by icons early on. Instead, you yourself go out and discover areas of interest, in much the same way as more contemporary Assassin's Creed games that adopt a Breath of the Wild light approach to world discovery. That said, it still suffers from many of the same issues as other open world games. There are towers to climb to open up more facilities and resources, except this time they are windmills. Many of the same fetch quests will appear dotted around the map, while the more interesting stuff is actually gated off because you don't have an item you need to access it. Meanwhile, the game has a lot of locations to visit and zombies to kill. With different tiers of difficulty in the open world, you will find different scenarios of flesh-eating hoodlums plus a variety of special archetypes that call for support, spit, goop, blow up, or hunt you down. Sounds a lot like another popular zombie game, actually. Fighting off the hordes is much like you'd expect it to go based on reading a ton of Walking Dead. Fighting one or two is fine, but hordes of them become problematic very quickly. There are also renegade survivors who want to kill you and steal your stuff, which leads to more nuanced melee combat. Funnily enough, I found this to be a bit of a weak spot, given their AI is actually pretty dumb. For the zombies, I expect that for the most part. 
But for the renegades, I often found that the easiest way to eliminate them was to lure them into crowds of zombies. I appreciate that building the spatial and combat awareness needed to make these characters truly intelligent in this kind of open world is really, really difficult. As a result, they're great in one-to-one -one fights and chasing the player around, but even so, their lack of intelligence at key points is one of the things that brought the experience down a bit, particularly when they hold so many camps in the open world that you need to clean them out from, and often the easiest trick was just to lure them out of those areas and into zombies that you'd kited nearby. And this speaks to a big part of what Dying Light is all about. As advocated in the pre-release marketing, the developers are confident there is over 500 hours of content in Dying Light 2 to keep you busy, but I'd argue it's a game that would be much more interesting if it was condensed. There's only maybe 20 hours of gameplay in here that's actually worth playing. A big part of that 500 hour gameplay is unlocking a lot of the skills and useful abilities you need not only to survive the harshest of night raids, but also navigating the terrain in fast and effective ways. Pretty much every embellishment of the core mechanics is gated off in the skill trees. Even stuff from the first game, like being able to slide when running, is locked off at the start. Of course, you'd expect this to be something you then unlock pretty early on, but the XP gains are so low early in the game that it will take a couple of hours of play before you unlock even a handful of perks. Meanwhile, some of the most interesting mechanics, such as the glider and the grappling hook, are gated off through story progression. Naturally, this is to incentivize you to play through the game more, but it took around 20 hours of playtime before the platforming aspect of the game begins to open up, and that felt like a tremendous waste of my time on the part of the game's progression system, particularly when you realize that this is a sequel to a game where a lot of these tools were made available to you already. At this point, I'd already seen most, most of what the game has to offer, and the level design doesn't introduce much to make these feel like meaningful additions to your arsenal. Instead, they more often feel like shortcuts. The grappling hook in particular is only really used in a handful of later story missions and particular skyscraper locales and isn't really serviced by the open world. It's all a little annoying. Given by the time I unlocked most of the later story items, they felt more like rewards to bypass the very game I'd spent a lot of time exploring. Much was made in the pre-release of the overall narrative of the game, but it's quite often the least engaging aspect of the experience and suffers by having very little influence on the overall gameplay. It really boils down to key decisions over whether you sacrifice a given resource, such as a building like a power plant, to one of the two main factions. These decisions ultimately influence what benefits you get from each. The peacekeepers provide more combat-based tricks like car bombs, electric traps and turrets, while the survivors offer more navigation-based tweaks to the environment such as zip lines, bounce pads and other tricks to help you move around more frequently. Once again, it often feels too little too late, given you can play the game for over a dozen hours before you unlock more than one or two of these additions. To a point, you learn to play the game without them, and as such they don't really become all that meaningful as you've often found other approaches to achieve the same goals. Plus, to reiterate my point already, Half of the things that they unlock are things that were available in the first game, and I really feel like I should have had a lot of that stuff from the get-go. Oh, speaking of the narrative, the writing in this game is verbose. I appreciate there has been a concerted effort to make each character feel a little more meaningful, but often I get two or even three minutes of backstory behind what ultimately amounts to just another fetch quest. It feels like a balance is really needed here. There was one mission that had me listen to a woman give a very detailed account of her kids and their dog who had gone missing. None of it was actually useful, given the mission simply told me the rough area of the map to head towards. Don't get me wrong, it's delivered with conviction, and it's generally pretty good. Hmm, I don't know, maybe. And some of the voice work is generally pretty good as well. But it has no real impact on the story, nor on my gameplay, given the missions are seldom built to support them. I realise I've been really giving this game a drubbing so far in this video, but not only did I complete the main storyline, I played through the game for all of around 50 plus hours and generally had a good time doing so. It really comes back to that core loop. The main loop of running around, jumping across rooftops and drop kicking a zombie into space is hella good. The issue is when you stop moving and look around at the game that it exists within and it begins to feel quite pedestrian. I could find I'd spend a couple of hours generally enjoying the experience only to stop and realise I'd made very little progression towards any of the markers I was supposed to be working on. And that really is the crux of Dying Light 2's issues. It gets in its own way of letting you have fun, and then letting that fun have any meaning, either because it interrupts for pages of dialogue to be narrated that I just don't care about, or denying the fun I'm having 
from having any major impact on either the game world, my progression, or my ability to have fun later in the game. The immediate moment to moment of it all is really quite satisfying, but it doesn't meld into something that really stands on its own merit or distinguish itself from pretty much any other open world game we've had come along in the past five years or so. Funnily enough, I realise that these are very much the same issues I had with the original game, albeit reframed and refreshed. As I said at the start of the video, it's a sequel that sticks to its guns, so really your mileage with Dying Light 2 will, I feel, be very heavily influenced by what you got out the first game. If you loved the first game, you're probably going to like this one too. I think I was looking for a more meaningful iteration on the formula between games, and while this game improves on the original in some aspects, the larger issues surrounding it are very much the same. The thing I got a lot out of in the first game was the cooperative multiplayer, running around and playing the game with friends, and I found that was really valuable to allow you to kind of circumvent the clunkiness of what was already there because you're having a more fun experience with a group of pals. And this time around I didn't get to do that as much, in part because the co-op felt really broken and clunky. To a point, we did it maybe two or three times, but we suffered so many disconnects we simply gave up and we all played it at our own pace. As a wrap up, I think the key thing for anyone interested in the game is whether that core gameplay loop is something you enjoy. And yeah, I think the fact that I found the original game quite middling but with some moments of genuine satisfaction, I feel that's then passed into the sequel because I think at the end of the day, it's really the same problems. But hey, let me know your thoughts on Dying Light 2 in the comments. Thanks for watching this episode of Smoke and Mirrors, and I'll be back with another video shortly. If I actually, I need to play a game. Ugh, games. <laughs>